blessings that the Sabbath brings. We're thankful, Father, for the food that you have fed us, both physically and spiritually today, and we ask, Lord, that you would continue to feed us the manna from heaven. We pray that the Holy Spirit be our great guide and teacher, and we ask that every heart and every mind would be open and attentive to your word. Father, we pray for both a spiritual and physical refreshing. The day has been long, it's hot, it's humid, but we pray, dear Father, that we would not be drowsy. Instead, Lord God, we pray that you would indeed boil up our spirits and help us, dear Father, to not lose uh, one seed from the word of God that you will sow in our hearts today. Guide and bless us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew the 5th chapter. Matthew chapter 5. We'll begin in verse 14. Matthew 5. And verse 14. Now, I've been asked to deal with the 17th chapter of Revelation, and so I'll begin dealing with Revelation 17 tomorrow. Because we're a little bit, a little bit tired, I want to switch the subject up just a little bit just for today and deal with something practical. Is that all right? So let's look at Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 14. Matthew 5. And verse 14, when you're there with me, let me hear you say amen. amen. The Bible says, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Now Christ, speaking to his people on the mountain, says that we are the light of what? The world. So when Jesus was saying that we are the light of the world, what was he referring to? Go with me to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we'll begin in verse, verse 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 5, the Bible says that you, I, we are the light of the world. So the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, let's look at verse 5 together, it says, children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the what? Darkness. Darkness. Now, the Bible is utilizing a principle here. Uh, many times in Scripture, when you're reading through the Bible, it uses what's called parallelism. And let me give you some examples of parallelism. Keeping your finger here in 1 Thessalonians, turn with me to, go with me to Psalm 33. Psalm 33. Let me give you just some quick examples of parallelism, and then we'll turn back to 1 Thessalonians 5. Psalm 33, let's look at verse 6 together. You have your finger in 1 Thessalonians 5, yes? All right, Psalm 33. Psalm 33, verse 6, very well-known verse of Scripture. The Bible says, by the what? By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his what? Mouth. Mouth. Now, if you look at verse 6, the Bible tells you the same thing in two different ways. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Parallelism. Saying the same thing twice in different fashion. Look at verse 7. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as an heap. He layeth up the depths in storehouses. Same thing, saying it, saying it twice, just a little bit different. Look at verse 8. Let all the earth, what? Fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in what? In awe of him. So when the Bible tells us to fear the Lord, it means to stand in awe of him. This is parallelism. Look at verse 9. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it what? Stood fast. Are you beginning to see? 
Same thing being said over and over again, just in two different ways in the same verse. Look at verse 10. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. Again, parallelism. And this is a technique that many Bible writers use, and Paul was no different. So if you go back to 1 Thessalonians 5, if you go back there with me, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, let's look at verse 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 5, the Bible says, Ye are all the children of what? Light and the children of the day. So in that phrase, light is the same as the day. And the Bible says, We are not of the what? Night, nor of the darkness. All right, so light is day, darkness is night. Very simple principle. Now, the first time you see that phrase in the Bible, day, light, darkness, night, is Genesis chapter 1. So go there with me to Genesis chapter 1. And remember, Christ says that we are the light of the world or the light of the earth. So in, first, in Genesis chapter 1, the first chapter of the Bible, Let's start just for context in verse 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. And when you're there with me, amen. The Bible says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be what? Light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light, what? Day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. So let's skip the next few days, and, or a couple of days, and go to day four. All right, day number four. Notice what your Bible says in verse 14. Genesis 1, verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for signs in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great what? Lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God said, let them, in, excuse me, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the what? The earth or the world. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So brethren, let me ask you this very simple question. What is the light of the day? Or the light of the world. It's the sun. And the light of the night is the one, The moon. So when Christ says that you are the light of the world, what was he saying that you and I were represented by? The sun. And you can take the book, uh, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, and you can read uh, what she says about Christ's Sermon on the Mount. And she says that the people of God gathered early, even before the sun came up. You didn't have to worry about them getting to Sabbath school on time. They were there before daybreak to listen to the words of God. And as the sun began to uh, lift up in the sky, Christ pointed to that sun and said, you are the light of the world. And so I want to look at the light of the world this afternoon, this evening. And so firstly, I want you to go with me in your Bible to the book of Philippians. Let's go in our Bible to the book of Philippians. Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Now I won't get into all the symbolism of the sun. Uh, the sun carries great symbolism uh, in the Bible. We don't have time for that. So instead of dealing with the symbolism of the sun, let's deal with light. What is our light? If you and I are represented by the sun, we are to give light unto the earth. Amen? Amen. So what is our light? Let's look what your Bible says in Philippians chapter 2. And we'll start in verse 14. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14. We're talking about light. What is the light that we are to give to the world? 
The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as what? Lights in the world, holding forth the word of what? Light. Now we'll just stop there. The Bible says that we are to shine as lights to the world. And what is the very first thing Paul identifies after identifying the light that we are to shine? He says we are to hold forth the words of life. In other words, this is our light. These are the words of life. Amen? Now let's be more specific. Don't just say the Bible. Not just the Bible is our light. Let's be more specific. Let's get into the book of Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. And let's start in verse 17. Romans chapter 2 and verse 17. Romans, what chapter are we going to? Chapter 2, verse 17. The Bible says, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and resteth in the what? The law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approveth the things that are of more excellent, being instructed out of the what? The law. And art confident that thou art thyself a guide of the blind, a what? A light of them that are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which hath the form of knowledge and of the truth in the what? In the law. Now we can just pause there. Paul is talking about a good Jew. And all of us, if we are sons and daughters of Abraham, we are spiritual Israel, we're spiritual Jews. And a Jew is to be a light to those in darkness. Now where does the light of a Jew come from? Paul says it three times in three verses. It comes from the law. So not just the Bible, but specifically the law of God is our light. Are you with me? Are you with me? The law of God is our light. All of the commandments of Jesus are our light. So when we come to individuals and we're trying to bring them out of darkness, we need to identify certain things to give them so that they can come out of darkness into the marvelous light. One of them is the words of life. You're to give them the Bible, not a portion of the Bible, but the whole Bible. In other words, your message is not merely prophecy. Your message encompasses more than the prophetic word. Amen. We must have a balanced message. The second thing the Bible identifies is that we have to give them the law of God. Not just the fourth commandment, but the whole law. See, many Seventh-day Adventists, we're, we're good with the fourth commandment, but we forget about many times the last six. We hate each other, but we keep the Sabbath. Amen? So we know how to, we, 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 we might worship God, but we don't know how to love our brother. And so if we're to be light, we're to give the Bible the whole word, Matthew 4, 4, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we're to give all of the commandments, not just in word, but also in deed and in truth. All right, so we're talking about light this evening. Go with me in your Bible to, let's go to, first, let's go to 2 Peter. Let's go to a well-known verse of Scripture. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Trying to be more specific in what our light is that we are to give to the world. We have the Bible. We have the law of God. If you're taking notes, the Bible, the law of God, and now number three, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. Now this is a verse of scripture I'm sure we're all very familiar with. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, we have also a more what? Sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star what? Arise in your hearts. So the Bible identifies what else as a light? 
the sure word of prophecy. So we don't dispense with prophecy. It's part of our light. And that's one of the reasons why Adventism is so dark in the world. It's because there are, are those in Adventism who have set prophecy aside and merely want to give the love of Jesus and don't realize that by setting prophecy aside, you eclipse the very love of Christ. You make the love of Christ, which should be light, you turn it into darkness. So God wants us to give the Bible, the whole word. He wants us to give the Ten Commandments, his law. And he wants us to give the sure word of prophecy. Are we all together so far? What else are we to give to the world? Go with me to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60, because Christ said that we are the light of the world. We are to shine as the sun. So what light are we to give to those in darkness? The Bible says in Isaiah 60 verse 1. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1. Notice what your Bible says, Isaiah 60 and verse 1. When you're there with me, amen. Arise and do what? Shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to whose light? Thy light. Thy light. And kings to the brightness of what? Thy, Thy rising. Now let's pause for a moment. The Gentiles, the heathen, they're going to come to whose light? Our light. But what light do you have? What light do you have? You don't have any light. I don't have any light. And that's why the Bible says, listen, arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. You don't give your own light to anybody. All you can do is lead people into darkness unless you turn them to the light of the world, which is Jesus Christ. So there is no light that has ever shone upon man save that which emanates from the face of Jesus Christ. Amen? So the Bible says that our light is his glory. Now, what is God's glory? Let's go on the Bible to the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 97. So we're going to Psalms 97. So we have the Bible. We have the law of God. We have the sure word of prophecy. Now we're looking at the glory of God as being our light. Now, what is God's glory? We're in Psalm 97. Psalm 97, and we'll start in verse 1. Psalm 97 and verse 1. The Bible says in Psalm 97 verse 1, and I'll give, you, I'll give you two scriptures dealing with the glory of God to kind of really make sure we understand it. The Bible says in Psalm 97 verse 1, The Lord reigneth, let the earth rejoice, let the multitude of isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. A fire goeth before him and burneth up his enemies round about. His lightnings enlighten the world. The earth saw and trembled. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The heavens declare his what? Righteousness. And all the people see his what? Glory. So how do the people see God's glory? The heavens declare his righteousness so then therefore what is God's glory his righteousness let me take you back to the book of Isaiah go with me to Isaiah uh, 62 Isaiah 62 Isaiah 62 verse 1 and 2 this go this goes along with what we read in Isaiah 60 verse 1 through 5 the Bible says in Isaiah 62, verse 1, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof, thereof go forth as what? Brightness. Remember, we're talking about our light. The righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof is a lamp that burneth, and the Gentiles shall see thy what? Righteousness and all kings thy glory. 
So when the Bible says that God's glory rises upon us as light, we're talking about the message of Christ, our righteousness. We're talking about the message of righteousness by faith. So not only the Bible, not only the law, not only the, the message of prophecy, but we must preach Christ, our righteousness. Without that essential part of the message, we are not giving forth light. Are you with me? You are not giving forth light if you diminish a portion of God's light. You guys know about the, you know about the prism, how the world, I mean, the, the sun gives forth the prism. It shows forth all different colors in light. What happens if one aspect of the prism is not showing right? The whole thing is not showing correctly. It's distorted. I like that word. So if we're giving a portion of the light, then our gospel is what? It's distorted. And who is light? Christ is light. So therefore, you're giving the world a distorted Jesus. Our light must be full and complete. The Bible, the law, the sure word of prophecy, Christ our righteousness. What else? Go with me to the book of Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi, I'm sorry, chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4, look with me in verse 2. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2. Malachi, what chapter are we going to? Chapter 4. Let's look at the second verse. What else is to shine like the light of the sun? The Bible says in Malachi 4, 2, But unto you that fear my name shall the what? Son, Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Now, if you have a margin in your Bible, that word wings actually is beams, like a sunbeam. So it says the Son of righteousness. Who is the Son of righteousness? Christ. And what does he have in the beams of his light? The Bible says healing. There is healing in his beams, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. So what else is to shine as the rays of the sun or as light? It's a message that is to bring healing. Now what message has God given to us Seventh-day Adventists that is to bring healing and health to the world? It's the message of health our health message. Now sometimes we have a distorted understanding of the message of health as well. We simply believe that our health message has to deal with only what's on our plate. But you see, our health message deals with how we dress. It deals with how we uh, entertain ourselves. And as a matter of fact, a Christian should never be entertained. You ever look at the word entertainment? You ever look at the word, words are powerful, brethren. The word entertain. What does the word enter mean? It means to come in. What is the word tame or attainment? The word meant at the end of any word means in the state of. So entertainment means you are in the state of being entered in and contained or held captive. Now we should not be entertained. The spirit of prophecy talks nothing about entertainment. It talks about recreation or recreation. And that's what we should have. Television merely entertains. You become a slave to the one-eyed monster. All right? We put in our ears. Many times that merely entertains and lets its proper music. And then even science shows it actually recreates in our brain. And so, brethren, the health message is not just about what you eat. It's about what you wear. It's about what you watch. It's about what you listen to. It's about what you read. It's about what you do. It's about how you go to school, what you learn. The message of education is part of the message of health because the message of health is the message of reform. So we're talking about all of our reforms. This brings health to the world. I don't know if you caught it, brethren, but as Brother Dalabai is taking you through just simple principles of education. Sister White, and I'm going to state it again, she says, unless we understand the true science of education, 
we will not enter the kingdom of God. Now that alone should make every parent say, well, I need to look at education afresh. Because if I'm praying for my sons and daughters at home, and yet I'm sending them forth to Babylon to be educated, how am I preparing my children? Will I be able to, when Christ comes, and he says, where is thy flock, thy precious flock, that I have given thee? Are we going to be able to answer in the affirmative, here they are, Lord? Or will you say, well, I didn't prepare them for the overflowing scourge? Brethren, our message is a complete message. Don't say, well, I like the prophecy, but that reform stuff, ah, later for that. You have a distorted view of Jesus, and therefore you're giving off a distorted view of Christ to the world. So the Bible, in the book of Malachi, says that our message that gives light is also a message of health, both mental, physical, spiritual, and social health. If you look in the book of Luke chapter 2, as a matter of fact, let's go there. The Lord says go there. Let's go to Luke chapter 2. Go with me to Luke, the second chapter. Luke chapter 2. Look at verse 52. Luke chapter 2 and verse 52. Luke chapter 2, what verse? 52, the messages that God gives to well round the man is fourfold. Notice what your Bible says. It says, and Jesus increased in what? Wisdom. Wisdom and stature and in favor with God. And what? Man, wisdom is what? That's mental. Stature is what? Physical. In favor with God is what? Spiritual. And in favor with man is what? Social. The word of God makes a rounded man. You are a full fold creature. Mental, physical, spiritual, and social. And if your gospel misses any one of those principles, you're making a distorted man. And so our message is complete. And so notice what your Bible says in the book of Ephesians now. Ephesians. Ephesians. Chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, let's look at verse 8 together. We're talking about a Christian's life. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 and the 8th verse, Ephesians 5, the 8th verse, the Bible says, for ye were sometimes what? Darkness, I'm sure all of us can raise our hands and say we were at some point in time in our life in darkness. And if we're really honest with ourselves, some of us might still be. The Bible says you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye what? Light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. In other words, live as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the what? Unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Let's pause. The Bible in verse 11 is identifying that darkness is unfruitful. Are you seeing that there? Darkness is unfruitful, so therefore light should be what? Fruitful. All right, that makes very much sense. Darkness is unfruitful. Light should therefore be what? Fruitful. So if we're to give light to the world, what fruit is to represent our light? Notice the same, same chapter. Look up again in verse 9. Verse 8 says we are to walk as children of light. In verse 9 it says, For the fruit of the what? Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and what? Truth. And we all know the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit is also our light. Matter of fact, some of you might are, are giving me an eye, a, a, a look that maybe you don't know the fruit of the Spirit, and that's all right. Maybe we have people with different, different understandings in the room. Go with me to Galatians chapter 5. Let's identify the fruit of the Spirit. 
Let's show the Bible. Let's show, let's show what the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is, which is what light is to give forth. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, I want to start in verse 19. Galatians chapter 5, what verse are we starting with? Verse 19, we're going to start with darkness first. Because darkness is unfruitful, but light is what? Fruitful. So let's look at the unfruitful works of darkness that, that, that the Bible said in the book of Ephesians that many of us sometimes were. Notice what it says. In Galatians 5 and verse 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, what? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, which are jealousies, wrath, strife, seditions, which are divisions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as also I told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Those are the works of darkness. And if we're practicing any one of those things, we cannot claim to be part of God's light. Now you might say, well, I don't practice witchcraft. Well, maybe you practice rebellion. Because rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. You might say, well, I don't do any of those. Maybe you're involved in fornication. That means you're practicing the works of darkness. You might say, well, I don't fornicate. Maybe there's jealousy. Maybe there's envy. Maybe there's seditions. Maybe, maybe you're one that likes to draw away people unto yourself, bringing about divisions. Any one of these things is darkness, and we will not inherit the kingdom of God. But all of us in here are children of light, and so therefore we should have the fruits of the Spirit. And so what are the fruits of the Spirit? The Bible says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So the Bible says, listen, our light is his word. It's the law of God. It's the sure word of prophecy. It's Christ our righteousness, the message of righteousness by faith. It's the messages of health and healing all of our reforms. The Bible shows our light is also the fruit of the Spirit. And we have one more to deal with. We can go on and on and on, but I'll just give you seven. It's a nice round number. All right, so go with me in your Bible. Go with me in your Bible back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew the fifth chapter. Matthew the fifth chapter, let's look at verse... 16. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. The Bible says, let your what? Light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What also is our light, according to the Bible? Good works. You can't have any kind of faith without works. Many of us might have works with no faith, but you can't have faith without works. It's dead being alone. But if we claim to be a people of light, if we have the Bible and the sure word of prophecy and the law and the message of righteousness by faith, if we have the reforms, if we have uh, the fruit of the Spirit, then all of this should be manifest in our what? In our works. Do you understand when the Bible told you in the book of Isaiah chapter 60 where it says, Arise and shine, for thy light has come? Arising and shining is action word. You can't shine sitting on your, on your bottle. He says, get up and shine. You don't shine hid, hidden behind four walls. The way that you shine as lights to the world is being out there in the world. In other words, you can't really give forth light and be children of light 
if you're not actively involved in sharing that light. Are you with me? You see, we would all love that our light would just be found in the pages of the Bible and not really written on the fleshly tables of our heart. We would all love if we didn't have to actually get up and get out and do something. And there's some damnable heresies coming across pulpits today that tell you that you don't have to do evangelism. That you just wait until the Sunday law and then you go forth and be a light to the world. Well, brethren, let me tell you something. That's a distorted gospel. Therefore, they believe in a distorted Jesus. The Bible tells us our light is active. It's shown forth in good works. Amen? Amen. Now, that was the introduction. All right? Because our message today is how many of us are hiding our light. First, we needed to see what our light was. But now let's talk about how we hide our light because Jesus tells you there's four ways that we hide our light. So we're just going to look at four things and then we'll close this evening. And the first one is found in Matthew 5. Let's start again in verse 14. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14. Again, when you're there, amen. Matthew 5 and verse 14. The Bible says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And we saw that we represent the sun. But now Christ identifies us as something else in verse 15. He says, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a what? Bushel. But on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. The Bible says that we are also identified as a candlestick that gives forth light. Now, we know the candlestick in Revelation 1, verse 20, represents the church. The seven-branch seven candlestick represents the seven churches. So we are represented by a candlestick. Now, let me ask a question. Does a candlestick give forth light? No. What does a candlestick do? It holds forth the light. Amen. Does a sun give forth, does the sun give forth light? Think about it now. Does the sun give forth light? I'm not asking you to look at science. I'm asking you to look at Bible. Does the sun give forth light? When was the sun made? What day of creation? Fourth day. When was light made? First day. Does the sun give forth light? No, the sun merely holds forth the light. So you are both the candlestick and the sun. You don't have your own light. Everything that we have is given to us. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it this way in 2 Corinthians. Notice what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You see, Christ made very clear, he, he chose clear principles when he was dealing with you and I. Because if he identified us as anything that had its own natural light, we'd be in trouble. So I want you to notice what Jesus does. Notice 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. Very, very beautiful scripture song, full of, full of beautiful truth. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God found where? In the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure, we have this light, this treasure, in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of who? God and not of us. It's not our own. God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. It shined in our hearts. That's the dark place. I don't know about you, but my heart is dark. And he's commanded in this dark heart for light to arise and shine. And the Bible says he does so so that the glory is not of us, but of God. It's God's light. And so therefore, you and I representing the sun or representing a candlestick, we don't give forth our own light. We hold forth the light. Amen? But there will be some of us there be some of us who have allowed our light to be hidden. 
And Christ identified in Matthew chapter 5 the first way that you can hide your light. The first way you can hide your light is under a what? A bushel. So what is a bushel? What is a bushel? Huh? What is a bushel? If any of us ever grow anything, we have, you know, a, a garden, especially a nice size garden. Whenever you go and you harvest your crops, let's say you grow corn. When you harvest your corn, if you have a lot of corn, you count your corn by the bushel. A bushel's worth of corn. In other words, it's a system of measurement. A bushel in the Bible is a farmer's measure of material success. Are you with me? A bushel represents your business transactions. A bushel represents your work, your jobs, the things that you do to gain wealth. And many of us are hiding our lights under a bushel. Let me read something to you. Let me read something to you. This is taken from volume six of the testimonies. Volume six of the testimonies, page 196. Volume six of the testimonies for the church, page 196, paragraph one. Once again, 6T, 196.1. Some church members, who are we talking about? Not the world, right? These are testimonies for the church. Some church members who have loved and feared God in the past are allowing their business to be all absorbing and are hiding their light under a bushel. They have forgotten to serve God and are making their business the grave of their religion. That's a serious statement. I'm going to read it again. She says, some church members who have loved and feared God in the past, who have loved and feared God in the past, are allowing their business to be all-absorbing and are hiding their light under a bushel. They have forgotten to serve God and are making their business the grave of their religion. Now, when you put something in a grave, what does that mean? So some of us in here, our religion has died because of that bushel, because of our business. We have allowed our religious experience to die because instead of going after Christ, we're going after filthy mammon or money. Now you might say, but pastor, the, the wise man said that money answereth all things. Money cannot buy your way into heaven. So it doesn't answer all things. Money cannot buy you forgiveness for your sins. Money cannot buy salvation. The Bible tells us that we have been purchased without money and without price. Instead, we've been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus. Money doesn't answer all things. And the greatest problems that you and I have is with ourself and sin. And yet we spend more time in our business transactions than we do in the Word of God, if we're honest. If, if you just want to think of something very practical, how many hours do you work a day, and how often do you spend in prayer and the study of God's Word? That's a real simple one. If you put it on a scale, business is becoming the grave of our religion. Now, that doesn't mean you spend all day in the Bible with your face in a book, but there's some, there's some practical things you can do. How many of us have a Bible? Now, all of you should raise your hand. If you don't have a Bible, you're in worse shape than I thought. All right, because most of you have cell phones, but you don't have a Bible. If you have a Bible, many of us, we get, we get some bigger Bibles, but we should also get a secondary Bible. The prophet of the Lord says we should get a little Bible. Why a little one? So that you can carry it in your pocket or carry it in your purse. And when you're standing in line at the bank, you break it out and you read. When you're waiting for the bus, you read. When you're walking on the street, you read. 
When you have a break at the job, you read. Keep your mind in the Bible. If you keep your thoughts in the Word of God, guess where your thoughts are not? They're not floating around in the world. You're not worried about what you see as you're walking the street. You're not worried about what that person is wearing. You're not worried about all these different things. If your mind is in the Word of God, sometimes you even go deaf to the sounds around you. You don't care about that beating drum that's coming out of somebody's car. Instead, your mind is in the Word of God. But again, some of us are making our business the grave of our religion. As a matter of fact, let me put up another statement. This is uh, Testimonies, Volume 5. Testimonies, Volume 5, this is page 426. This is uh, paragraph 1 as well. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 426, paragraph 1. Satan makes every effort to lead people away from God, and he is successful in his purpose when the religious life is drowned in business cares, when he can so absorb our minds in business that they will not take time to read their Bibles, to pray in secret, and to keep the offering of praise and thanksgiving burning on the altar of sacrifice morning and evening. Now, how many, how many of us, don't raise your hand, I want you to really do some introspection. Think about your own experience. How many of us take time, get up early, and have devotion? And I'm not talking about the little, you know, the little morning watch devotionals. I'm not talking about the little two or three paragraph devotion. That's not devotion, brethren. That's a quick read. How many of us take time to go through our Bibles to allow God to really flood our minds with thoughts for the day? How many of us take time to pray? Not the quick prayers, not the quick prayers, but the prayers that have substance. And that doesn't mean you have to spend hours on your knees, although there are times when you need to do that. But God is looking for a quality religion. He's looking for a religion with substance. How many of us pray, study our Bibles, spend time with God morning and evening? Now, some of us might say, well, I'm glad I do that every morning. But let's be real. When we come from the job and we're tired and our feet hurt and all you want to do is take a shower or soak in a bath and get in the bed, again, you're putting your business primary and God secondary at best. At best. Spend time in the Word of God. Do not allow your light to be hidden under a bushel. Are you with me? Amen. Go with me in your Bibles. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew again. Matthew. Matthew chapter 16. Before we move on to the second way to hide our light, I want to just look quickly at one verse, very well-known verse. But let's look together in verse 25, Matthew 16. Matter of fact, start with me in verse 24. Matthew 16, verse 24. Matthew 16 and verse 24. I tell you what, start with me. Start with me, verse 21. I'm going to show you something here. Verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then who? Peter. Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he, Christ, turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of what? 
men. Now, we all know that experience, right? Where Peter, he rebukes Jesus, and Jesus has to rebuke the devil that was working through Peter. Right after that experience, notice what Jesus does in verse 24. What's that first word? Then. In other words, right after. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now we all, we, we, we've read those verses before, but we don't see the connection. Why did Jesus say this right after his experience with Peter? Why did he say it? Why would Jesus have to emphasize, listen, if you're going to come after me, you need to take up your cross, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Because whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. Because what does it profit if you gain the world and lose your own soul? Why is that connected with the experience with Peter? You know about Peter's experience, right? We understand that Peter, he tried to save his own life and, his li and the life of, of Christ. Remember when he took the sword and cut off Malchus' ear, missing his throat, trying to kill the man? We understand that Peter's mind at that point in his experience was not all in God, Business was still in the back of his thoughts. How do we know? Because the moment he was disappointed, he went back fishing, which was his profession. Christ took him from that job, wanted to make him a fisher of men. But he went right back to his old business cares. And so when Christ was identifying and dealing with Peter, what allowed the devil to use Peter was the fact that Peter was not 100 with, with Christ may have been 90%. Maybe he had a 50-50 religion, like many of us. And as a result, Satan was able to use Peter as a medium to get to Christ. The Bible shows, what does it profit if we gain the whole world and lose our own soul? Don't let the bushel be the grave of your religion. Go with me in your Bible to the book of Mark. Go with me to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Very interesting when you read through the Gospels. Each of the Gospel writers, they, they identify certain things a little differently. And so notice what Mark says here. Mark chapter 4 and verse 21. Were all of them sitting at the feet of Jesus? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Yes or no? All of them were. Did all of them hear Christ's Sermon on the Mount? All of them did. But when Matthew wrote, he identified the bushel. When Mark writes, what does he identify in addition to the, bush, the bushel? The Bible says, and he said unto them, verse 21, Mark 4, verse 21, are we all there? And he said unto them, as a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a what? A bed and not to be set on a candlestick. The Bible identifies not only a bushel, but a what? A bed can hide our life. So let's identify the bed. Is that all right? Remember, we only have four things to go through. We're on number th num the second one now. So notice what your Bible says in the book of Proverbs 26. Proverbs 26. Let's identify the bed quickly. And we can probably spend a whole sermon on the bed. But notice Proverbs 26. Some of us are hiding our light under a bed. Notice Proverbs 26. Let's look at verse 14. Proverbs 26 and verse 14. Now we won't spend long on this point. Proverbs 26 and what verse? Verse 14. The Bible says, As the door turneth upon his hinges... So doth the what? 
slothful upon his bed. When someone is slothful, what's another name for slothful? Lazy. Some of us are hiding our light behind laziness. Whereas there are those who are hiding their light under business cares. Maybe they're workaholics. Some of us don't work at all. I'm not talking about those who can't find a job because of a recession. I'm talking about those who just don't work. The Bible does not sanction that type of activity, brethren. The Bible never sanctions that type of activity. Scripture says we are to occupy until Christ comes. And when you look at that in the Bible, if you have not been called from the plow to place your hands on the gospel plow, if you have not been called from the world's plow, you need to work. You have bills to pay. Some of you have mouths to feed other than your own. And you should not hope that the church will take care of your problems. If you are able-bodied, you should work. Amen. You ever read in the spirit of prophecy how she identifies the poor? And the reason why I'm saying this, brother, I, you know, I pastor churches. And I'm sure that there's the same, and there's same issues in every church I've been to. So there might be this problem here. So I'm going to deal with it. Is that all right? And if the problem isn't here, we'll deal with it before it gets here. There are some people who will come to the church and ask the church to take care of them financially. Listen to me now. I'm not talking about those who do, the God, who do God's work and should live of the gospel. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about those who could be out there working but just decide not to work. And when bills come around, they come to the church and say, hey, I need 200 or I need 100 or I need this or I need that or the other. When you read in the spirit of prophecy, she talks about who are the Lord's poor and who are not the Lord's poor. And the Lord's poor that do deserve our charity are those who are widowed with children, those who have a handicap and cannot work, those who are unable to work because of any type of illness, those are the Lord's poor. But those who are strong and can get out and do something, even if it means hustling from day to day, I'm talking about a proper hustle. Amen. Proper hustle. I got to properly hustle sometimes. Sometimes you may have to do a little side job. We don't need to take care of those who are not the Lord's poor. As a matter of fact, she's very clear that you place an undue strain upon the church and you do wrong by those brethren because you're teaching them to be lazy. And laziness and business cares transfers also to laziness and spirituality. So some of us can be hiding our light under laziness. And then we can talk about laziness in a different way. Remember the arising and shining because our light has come? Some of us are spiritually lazy. We like to get spiritually fat. We like to eat all the time and never share it. And that type of spiritual laziness will put out your light. Think of it in a very practical way. You ever have a candle burn and you put a candle underneath something? What happens to the candle? Does it go out immediately? No, slowly it begins to flicker, goes out, 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 out until finally there's nothing but smoke. And if you're lucky, you can take off the top, blow on it a little bit, and the flame might start again. And that's why the Bible says that God, Christ, will not even put out a bruised flax or a smoking flax or a bruised reed. If there's a little bit of life in that fire, he wants to ignite it again. But some of us keep our candle under something so long that it's dead. And you need to be lit in a brand new by the fire of the Holy Spirit in order to really shine in the world. So laziness is a means of hiding our light. Let's look at one more thing in the book of Genesis. Go with me in your Bible to Genesis 49. Genesis, what chapter are we going to? 49. Now, as we turn to Genesis 49, I want to pull something up for you. Genesis chapter 49.
Genesis chapter 49. And let's look together in verse 3. Genesis 49 and verse 3. Amen when you're with me. The Bible says, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the, ex and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defiledest thou it, he went up to my couch. Now we know the story of Reuben. Why was Reuben not just, why was Reuben cursed here instead of blessed by his father? Huh? He slept with his father's wife, his father's concubine. He slept with his father's woman. And the Bible said he defiled his father's bed. The bed not only represents laziness, you can take this through the Bible, the bed also is a symbol of lust. And the type of lust I'm referring to is that of a sexual nature. And some of us are snuffing out our light behind that type of bed experience. Now I heard the elder today when he was uh, preaching this morning during divine service. He talked about something or he said something that most people don't like to deal with in the pulpit. But I want to deal with it. I'm talking about self-abuse, masturbation. And parents, don't start covering your children's ears because this is a subject that mothers and fathers are told they need to teach their children about. They need to teach their children about this and there's never, it's never not a time to explain to your children. When you read through the Spirit of Prophecy, she says that this type of sin happens even in the crib. How children begin to do things to themselves even in the crib. It's never too young. The child is never too young to explain to them how they should keep their body in holiness and sanctification. And so don't cover your children's ears because I'm going to read to you from a book called Appeal to Mothers. It's a book called Appeal to Mothers. This is something that she, she begged mothers to teach their children about. And this is not just about children. It's not just about children, as long as I've pastored, as long as I've counseled, I know that grown men, whether they be married, and grown women, practice it alike. And something that I've found very interesting, more often than not, and I don't like to counsel women, I'm just gonna tell you that right now. I don't like counseling women, not because I have a problem with women, it's just that sometimes there are problems that only women should counsel women about. And sometimes you find out the hard way. But I've traveled long enough to know that women have this problem even sometimes more than men. And so I want to read to you what Sister White says about self-abuse. And I like that term, self-abuse, because it really gives us an idea of what we're doing to ourselves when you practice that, that sin. This is Appeal to Mothers, page 25, paragraph 1. And I really want you to pay attention because if you're involved in this, if your children are involved in these things, and when you read in the spirit of prophecy, take time to read Child Guidance or Advent's Home. Read those books. Take time to read Appeal to Mothers. There are signs in which you can tell if your children are involved in these things. And sometimes as parents, we don't have a clue because we're not really paying attention to our children. We become a statistic. You know, statistically, let me ask you this. Here's a statistic, and it's a very terrible statistic. What is the average time that a parent spends in meaningful conversation with their child throughout the week? Give me some numbers. What is the average time? I'm talking about the average household in the world. The average household. What is the average amount of time that parents spend with meaningful conversation with their children during the week? Five minutes? Man, it's pretty bad. You think five minutes? Half an hour? Come on, give parents some love. Half an hour? 
try 3.5 minutes. I'll give you the, the reference to that statistic later. 3.5 minutes. And you know why? Maybe I'll have to bring this in with Revelation 17. When we deal with Revelation 17, because I'm going to deal with the United Nations in Revelation 17. There is a charter that in 1945, the United Nations borrowed from a woman by the name of Alice A. Bailey. And if you know anything of Alice A. Bailey, she wrote a 10-point charter. And I'm going to show you the whole thing. And in this 10-point charter, she talks about how to destroy your home. How to destroy your home. And the reason why she wants your home destroyed is because if you can destroy a home, you can destroy the church. And if you destroy the church, you destroy the community. And if you destroy the community, you destroy the, the, the nation, you destroy the world. And therefore, they need a worldwide governing body to tell you how you should live your life, how you should discipline your children, what type of scholastic learning they should receive. All right, these, this 10-point chart, I'll read this to you, but statistically, when I read this charter to you, some statistics are on this chart and shows 3.5 minutes is the average family's time they spend in meaningful communication with their children. I'm talking about sitting down and, and, and instructing the children. Not just the quick, how was your day, while you're eating a sandwich or eating a plate of food. I'm talking about meaningful conversation with your child. We're talking about self-abuse, right? Page 25 of Appeal to Mothers, paragraph one. There was a man who was sick. She talks about his case. And she says, he, his case was shown me in vision. This man was sick and asked for prayer. And notice what she says. His case was shown me in vision. I saw that he was deceived in regard to himself and that he was not in favor with God. He had practiced self-abuse until he was a mere wreck of humanity. This vice was shown me as an abomination in the sight of God. No matter how high a person's profession, those who are willing to be employed in gratifying the lust of the flesh cannot be Christians. As servants of God, as servants of Christ, their employment and meditations and pleasure should consist in things more excellent. Many are ignorant of the sinfulness of these habits and their certain results. Such need to be enlightened. Some who profess to be followers of Christ know that they are sinning against God and ruining their health, yet they are slaves to their own corrupt passions. They feel a guilty conscience and have less and less inclination to approach God in secret prayer. They may keep up the form of religion, yet be destitute of the grace of God in the heart. Some of you might be wondering why your religious experience takes nose dives, and you find out that you don't want to pray anymore. You find out that reading and studying the Bible is boring. It might be because of an evil habit of self-abuse. And you might think it doesn't hurt anybody. Oh, it hurts more than you think, because it definitely hurts yourself. And don't tell me what the doctor said, and the teacher said, and the pastor say, it's okay to practice it. You might say, no, no, no pastor teaches that. I heard it when I was young, in the church. Pastor saying it was, it was natural, it was normal, it was even healthy for a person to explore themselves. No, brethren, it's animalistic. That's what apes do. And unless you believe in the principles of evolution, you did not come from a monkey. So you should have a higher mind controlling the baser passions and not the other way around. So it says this. It says, they have no devotedness to his service, no trust in him, no living to his glory, no pleasure in his ordinance, no delight in him. The first commandment requires every living being to love and serve God with their whole mind and strength. Especially should professed Christians understand the principles of acceptable obedience. Can any expect that God will accept a profession 
a form merely while the heart is withheld and they refuse to obey his commandments. They sacrifice physical strength and reason upon the altar of lust. And can they think that God will accept their distracted, imbecile service while they continue this wrong course? Such are just as surely self-murderers as though they pointed a pistol to their own breast and destroyed their life instantly. What does she connect self-abuse with? Self-murder, what do we call that? Suicide. And don't anybody in here come to the, foul, the, the thinking, this, this false thinking that if you commit suicide, you can still be saved. Oh no. Self-abuse is destroying your life slowly, but just as surely as you taking a pistol and blowing out your own brains. Don't think that we can consider ourselves Christians. Don't think that we have any light to give if we're practicing these things. And she goes on and on and on and on referring to the evils of self-abuse. But I'll save you some of those things. I want you to go with me in your Bible to the book of Luke. Go with me in scripture to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 8. Many of us are hiding our light under our business cares, the bushel. Some of us are hiding our light under a bed, laziness or lust. We don't need to talk about fornication and adultery and all of these things. I'm sure you know that that would destroy your Christian experience. So I wanted to deal with something that people think is personal that only affects themselves. You continue to read in Appeal to Mothers, page 25 and 26. Not only do you kill yourself, but eventually you will become a burden upon those in your family because it will destroy your health. Now some people later in life, they become inv invalids or invalids. And the doctors might say, oh, it's because of this or it's because of that, of, of that disease where the books of heaven trace it all the way back to self-abuse. And so you're not just affecting yourself. You read in the spirit of prophecy, she talks about, and many people make, make, make fun of these things. She says that those who practice self-abuse will become mad. In other words, they go crazy. She talks about blindness and all these different things. Now science will say, that's impossible. No, it's not. You deplete yourself of zinc and find out what happens. And that's what happens when you practice self-abuse. You deplete your body of zinc and eventually you'll go blind and you will go mad. You will be in a crazy house because of self-pleasuring. As a matter of fact, the world, I heard this term the other day, I thought it was interesting. Self-love. That's self-abuse, that's what they call it, self-love. Making love to yourself. That's the epitome of selfishness. And yet we think it's natural. Not natural at all. Luke chapter eight. Notice what your Bible says in Luke chapter eight, verse 16. What's another way we can hide our light? Two more, and we'll do these quick. Luke chapter eight and verse 16. Luke chapter eight and verse 16. When you're there with me, amen. Luke chapter eight, verse 16. Are we all there? No man, when he hath lighted a candle, cover it with a what? Vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. So here in the book of Luke, it doesn't say bushel. What does it say? Vessel. Now it's two different words in the Bible. And it means two different things. The word vessel, if you're into the Greek and Hebrew, the word vessel here in the Greek is the word skuos, which simply means stuff, things, tangible things. I want to show you that a vessel can be anything. Matter of fact, go with me to the Old Testament book of Leviticus. Leviticus uh, 11. Leviticus chapter 11. Let me give you just one verse quickly to show you that a, a vessel can be anything. It could be a garment. It can be something made of stone. It can be made of wood. It can be made of gold. It can be made of plastic. 
It can ring when someone calls you. You can tweet on it. Right? You, you, you can type your friends on it. You can click the channel on that stuff. And many of us hide our light under stuff. Notice what your Bible says in Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11 verse 32. Leviticus chapter 11 verse 32. The Bible says, and upon, and upon whatsoever any of them when they are dead doth fall, it shall be unclean. Whether it be any what? Vessel of wood. We're looking at the word vessel. Whether it be any vessel of wood or what? Raiment or skin or sack, whatsoever vessel it be, wherein any work is done, it must be put in water and it shall be unclean until the even, so it shall be cleansed. And every what? Earthen vessel, whereunto any of them falleth, whatsoever it is in any, uh, any excuse me, whatsoever is in it, in it shall be unclean, and he shall break it. If you look at Solomon's temple in 1 Kings chapter 7, he had vessels made of gold and vessels made of silver. Vessels are composed of any type of material. Are you with me? So a vessel, brethren, a vessel can be anything. Do you remember when Jesus was teaching the principle or the parable in Matthew chapter 12 about binding the strong man? Do you guys know that, 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 that parable? He says, no man enters into a strong man's house to spoil his goods unless he first bind the strong man. You know that, 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 that scripture? The term goods is the same word skuos. It just means your things. And many of us, we like the newest shoes. We like the newest clothes. We want to be at the epitome of fashion. We like the newest gadgets. And oh, I love technology. Anybody who knows me knows I'm a gadget man. But I won't let gadgets hide my light. We can't let anything eclipse our light or hide our light. And some of us, we like beautifying our homes more than we beautify the church of God. We spend more time in making sure our homes look good and bring a, a meager offering to church. Meager offering. How much has God done for you? Don't answer now because if you say much, that's how much you owe him. How much has God done for you? What has he done for you? Do you know how we can show our appreciation? When you study the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, one way you can show your appreciation to God is by returning both tithes an offering. And did you know that a good Jew, spiritual Israelite, right? A good Jew, how much of their entire income did they give to the Lord on a yearly basis? How much? Now you might say, well, I know 10% had to be given because that's a requirement. But you see, offering, that's just whatever we have. Isn't that how we, we believe about tithes and offering? Not so. Because in the Bible it talks about a second tithe. You ever read about that? And the second tithe is an offering. That goes to the poor. That doesn't even go to the church. That goes directly to the poor. So you're already in the whole 20%. So what do you bring to church now? What's your offering for the church? You see, a good Israelite gave no less than one-third of their entire income to Jesus. That's 33%. How many of us love Jesus enough? How many of us love Jesus enough? You see, if we really thought about it, if we really thought about it, you wouldn't even have to rent a building if you really return to God as you should. You can have a building fund and build your own place of worship. Set up a memorial in, in every area like we're told we're supposed to do. But that'll never happen if we become stingy and the way that we give to God. We don't do that to ourselves. We make sure we get what we want. When does Jesus get what he needs? He needs a memorial in Barbados. I want you to listen now. He needs a memorial in Barbados. 
One of the reasons why self-supporting work fails in every part of the world, one of the reasons that self-supporting churches and fellowships fail is because they're meager in what they do for Jesus. They think that we can just rent and that's enough. God wants you to have your own place of worship. It's not only just a suggestion in the spirit of prophecy. That's one of the commands that those who believe present truth go forth to do. Think about all of the different heresy movements. The God doesn't kill movement. What about the there's no Holy Spirit movement? What about, all the, what about all the different winds of doctrine movements? They have their own churches. They have their own places of worship. When is present truth in Barbados going to get their own? But many of us are hiding our light under a vessel, under stuff. The Bible tells us in the book of Luke again, the book of Luke chapter 11. Just because we're going to deal with practical things, brethren, doesn't mean they're not cutting things. Sometimes practical things are the most hurtful to the pride and heart of man. But they're truth, and they must be received as truth, or spiritual shipwreck will transpire. The Bible tells us in the book of Luke, the book of Luke, go with me to Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, Last one, Luke chapter 11 and verse 33. Luke chapter 11 and verse 33. And when you're there with me, amen. Luke chapter 11, 33. We'll look at maybe three, four scriptures in close. Luke chapter 11, verse 33. The Bible says, No man, when he hath lighted a candle, putteth it where? in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. So we've talked about a bushel being our business cares, and how many of us are hiding our light under a bushel, making our business the grave of our religion. We've talked about putting our light under a bed because of laziness and lustful passions. Some of us are snuffing out the gospel light. We talked about putting our light under a vessel, under those goods, those, those, those vessels, those things, those things that we want and desire. And we put Christ second to last instead of first place. The Bible tells us here that now you can put your candle in a secret place. Now in about four scriptures, let's talk about what the secret place represents and then we'll close. Go with me in your Bible to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 27. Deuteronomy chapter 27. Let's look together in verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 27 and verse 15. Deuteronomy 27, what verse are we going to? Verse 15. The Bible says, Cursed be the man, cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and putteth it in a what? Secret place. And all the people shall answer and say what? Amen. What is a molten or graven image? The work of the hands of a craftsman. What is that? An idol. I heard someone say an idol. Where are idols put? According to that verse, idols are put in secret places. So let's find out from the book of Ezekiel chapter 14 where the secret place is that the idol is placed. Notice Ezekiel 14. Notice what your Bible says in the book of Ezekiel chapter 14. Where do many of us place our idols? Ezekiel 14 and verse 1. Some of us might not have a problem with the, the bushel, but we have a problem with the bed 
Or some of us have problems with a vessel. Then there might be some of us with a problem with a secret place. And then there might be some of us that have problems with all four. But God is identifying to you tonight how you're hiding your light. Notice what your Bible says in the book of Ezekiel 14, verse 1. Ezekiel 14, verse 1. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their what? Heart. And put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his what? Heart. And putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face. And cometh to the prophet, I the Lord will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. Says that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart. Because they are all estranged from me through their what? Idols. So idols are placed in the secret place, but the idols are placed where? In the heart. So what is the secret place? The heart. Now idols, idols is a very broad term. Because just like a vessel, an idol can be made of anything. An idol can be made of anything. I often ask people this. Think about this now. Most of us that have, say, cell phones, where do we put our cell phones when we go to sleep? Everybody does the same thing right there on the mantle, right? The little, the little, the little, right? The little side table by the bed. I mean, you know, you put it right there. Why do we put it right there? Easy access, right? Where do you put your Bible? Huh? Some of y'all probably can't even find it. Many of us don't put our Bible right there. When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you reach for? And I understand, hey, some of you might see that I'll reach for my iPad, I'll reach for my phone in the morning. I do so, but it's not necessarily to see the latest tweet or check out Facebook. I like to look at the Bible on there and read the spirit of prophecy on there. Brethren, what do we reach for first in the morning? What do we do? I think I made this, you know, I think it was 2010 was the very first prophecy school here. I remember making a challenge then. And I'll make the same challenge now. Take your Bible. Take your cell phone. Or take your television remote control. Put it right there on the, you know, little table in your house. And mark down which one you reach for the most throughout the week. It's become an idol. You can't live without it. As a matter of fact, there's a 90-day challenge. There's a 90-day challenge. It's a very good challenge. There's, there's, a, there's a, 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 a series called The Distraction Dilemma. Anybody ever heard of that? It's an 11-part series called The Distraction Dilemma by Christian Berdahl. All right, he's, he's, he's a Seventh-day Adventist singer and evangelist. Now, he put together an 11-part series on entertainment, media, music, movies, all type of things. And at the end of this 11-part series, he gives a 90-day challenge. 90 days without media. 90 days, no Facebook. 90 days, no Twitter. No Google Plus. 90 days, no, no surfing the internet. 90 days, no television of any kind. 90 days, no music of any kind. 90 days, no media of any kind. Instead, spend time studying your Bible. Instead, pick a, a book from the Spirit of Prophecy and read it chapter by chapter. Those who have taken the challenge, some people who thought that, oh man, no problem, after one week, climbing the walls, feeling like they're in jail, not realizing that they've been tethered to an electronic leash and are slaves and servants to these idols. You have to realize, brethren, what we spend time with the most becomes an idol. The Bible 
tells us that many of us have idols in our, in our hearts. Idols in the secret place. Those who took the 90-day challenge and went through the entire 90 days, you know what they said? They said they finally heard God speak to them. They heard the voice of God. They knew what it meant to be still and know that he's God. They knew what it meant for all the earth to keep silence before him because he's in his holy temple. They knew what it meant to really commune with their maker. I don't know about you, brethren, but don't you want that experience? Yes. Some of us need to cut the electronic leash. Some of us have idols and we don't realize it. And then some of us have idols out of our opinions. Spirit of Prophecy says that the scribes and Pharisees, they made idols of their own opinion. Some of you have different beliefs in the word of God. You can't substantiate it through the Bible, though. But that's what you believe. Those opinions become idols. And you can worship an opinion just like a person can worship Baal. And both will lead you to hellfire. We need to let go of the idols in the secret place. Let's just look at a few verses quickly. Go with me in your Bible to the book of Psalms. Psalms. We'll look at two, two verses in Psalms while we close. Go with me to Psalms 90. Psalm 90. Psalm 90 and verse 8. Psalm 90 and verse 8. And I know I've took, taken liberties with your time, 15 minutes over, but it's still Sabbath. Right? All right, where else are you going to go, right? I know we're all tired. I'm tired too. Psalm 90. Psalm 90. This is going to help you out after the Sabbath, right? Although some of those plans that maybe you had after the Sabbath, you need to change them now. Right? I'm helping you out. I'm doing you a favor. All right? It's called doing you a solid. That's what I'm doing for you. So notice what it says in Psalm 90. Psalm 90. The Bible says in Psalm 90, verse 8, what are some of our idols that we put in the secret place. The Bible says in Psalm 90 verse 8. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee. Our what? Secret sins in the light of thy countenance. You remember when the Bible says that. If, if we regard iniquity in our hearts. The Lord will not what? Hear us. Let's make it practical. How do we regard iniquity? First of all what's the, re the word regard mean? What does it mean? You regard iniquity. If you hold somebody in regard, what does that mean? You respect them. You hold them in high esteem. You might put them on a pedestal. Some of us regard iniquity in our hearts. You know that sin. The one, you've gone through your closet, right? You've gone through the closet of your heart. You've got all the bones out the closet. All right? You've got all the, all the different things in the closet that, that you were trying to hide for years, but that one thing... You put it on the very shop top shelf of the closet of your heart. You put it all the way towards the back. You cover it up with some stuff just in case Jesus might see it. I'm talking about that sin. That's the idol in the secret place. That's the one that you didn't give up yet. That's the one that you, I know Jesus, you have the power to do it, but I'm not ready to give it. That sin. The Bible shows that you are hiding your light in a secret place. And therefore you're not shining at all. And therefore you can't be a Christian at all. Even though you might have the name. Like Sardis you have a name that you live but you're dead. You are a Christian by name only. That's what you call nominal. We talk about nominal Adventism all the time. Those who worship in the popular churches. Oh they're nominal. Not realizing that we have the same problem in present truth around all this light and yet hiding our sin in the secret place this is how we snuff out the truth and this is why many of us are not growing as we should the Bible says in the book of Psalms Psalms 19 Psalms 19 last scripture let's make this our prayer tonight Psalms 19 Psalms 19, verse 12. 
Psalms 19, verse 12. Last scripture, and last time I ask you to say amen tonight when you're there. Psalms 19, verse 12. Are we all there? Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from what? Secret faults. That needs to be our prayer tonight. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed. And if you've already been sleeping, keep your eye closed. Just pray now. All right? Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Bow your heads. Don't look at me. I want you to think. I want you to pray. I want you to listen to Jesus' voice. Some of us have made the bushel the grave of our religion. Some of us are dying spiritually behind our business, our jobs. Some of us are just plain lazy, both spiritually and physically. And that also is hiding our light under the bed. Some of us have problems with lustful thoughts. We don't know how to control our eyes. We're involved in sinful behavior. Some of us are involved in fornication, maybe even adultery. And we're hiding our light under a bushel. Hiding our light under a bed, rather. Some of us are so connected to the stuff of this world allowing the lust of things to choke out the word like a weed. Some of us are dying spiritually because of that secret sin that we don't want to relinquish to Jesus. But while we're still in the lingering twilights of Sabbath, and I want to hold on to the promise that Sister White says that Christ He's willing to answer our prayers on the Sabbath even before the Sabbath is over. And so we want to ask specifically tonight for God to forgive us for hiding our light under the bushel, under the bed, under the vessel, or in the secret place. And forgiving us, we want to ask God for forgiveness and power to cleanse from these sins. We want to ask Christ to take our life, take our hearts afresh. And some of us, maybe even for the first time, want to give your hearts to Jesus and say, Lord, control my heart. Keep it clean because I cannot keep it clean for thee. Save me from myself, my weak, unchristlike self. This is your prayer today. And if this is what we want God to do for us, I'm just going to ask that we stand together. You stand to your feet if you want God to forgive your sins. Forgive him for a, a, a hiding your light under the bed, under the bushel, under the, the vessel or, or the secret place. Stand if you want God to forgive and cleanse you from sin. And you want him to give you power to keep that heart clean from this point forward. Father in heaven, I stand with my brethren and my sisters, and we do not stand in our Phariseeism before the Lord. Instead, Father, we stand at the beckoning call of Christ, giving our hearts afresh. We ask you, dear Lord, as the Sabbath is, is quickly closing, to accept one last prayer for your children on this Sabbath day. Forgive our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Blot out our transgressions. Purge us with hyssop so that we can be clean. Wash us so that we can be whiter than snow. And take that newly renewed heart. Take that cleansed heart and keep it clean. Forgive us, dear Lord, for the bushel experience. Forgive us, dear Lord, for the experience of hiding our light under our bed or under the vessel, or in the secret place. Transform us anew, and may we be as lights to the world. Thank you, dear God, for your love and kindness. Thank you for laboring with your children. Thank you for your spirit. And I pray, dear Lord, that we will continuously hear your spirit's voice when we go our several ways. Be with us, Lord, as we depart one from another but by God's grace, never departing from your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.